As we departed the canals of Amsterdam aboard the MS Koningsdam, we entered the choppy North Sea dotted with oil rigs and windmills. Our destination, Norway, the land of the mighty Vikings, deep valleys, snow-capped mountains, and spectacular vistas. Norway is a peaceful place that has been the desire of many, rejected by many more, and is currently occupied by a proud and hardy few. The western half of the Scandinavian peninsula is an environment that can vacillate from peaceful to menacing or anything in between. Norway is home to just more than 5 million people, giving it the third thinnest population of the more than 50 countries and regions considered part of Europe. As we toured our first stop of Oslo, we were often reminded that this once poor country is now wealthy and independent of the European Union. In fact, the Norwegians were once considered some of the poorest people in Europe, thanking potatoes and the fishing industry for keeping them alive. Then, like TV's Beverly Hillbillies, they struck oil in the North Sea about 50 years ago, so now They've climbed the economic ladder and become one of the richest European nations. Norway is the world's second largest exporter of fish, the fifth largest oil exporter, and third largest gas exporter. Money from these industries and other resources also make them one of the largest banking powers in the world. Still, the nation's rags-to-riches tales are peppered with dashed dreams. At the Norwegian Royal Palace, the King's Guards stood proudly at the top of Oslo's main street, Karl Johansgata. The soldiers are part of a dynasty that has played a huge role in the on-again, off-again independence of this country of extremes. For instance, while we visited in late June, daytime lasted almost 19 hours. The sun would rise about 4 a.m. and not set until almost 11 p.m. In the winter, imagine those long spans of darkness lasting as long as the summer days, accompanied by the bone-chilling winter cold. Oslo is only about 500 miles south of the Arctic Circle, which crosses the northern part of Norway. During our palace tour, they made us abandon our phones and cameras to prevent any photography, so I borrowed some from the palace website to remind us of what we saw. The guide told a story of how the stark conditions made it hard to find a king about 200 years ago, willing to brave the cold and rule the country. Although the Norwegian monarchy dates back more than a millennium to Harald Farhar, the independent monarchy was then disrupted by wars and foreign dominance for more than 500 years. In the 1300s, Denmark took over the Norwegian kingdom. Then. After Denmark sided with Napoleon in the early 1800s, Britain successfully blockaded Norway and cut it off from the mother nation, giving it a taste of independence again. It didn't last as Swedish troops from next door invaded, making Norway part of Sweden until 1905. That was when the Swedes and Norwegians went their separate ways and Norway became independent again and began looking for a new king. Having no royal bloodlines left after centuries of war and foreign rule, the Norwegians went back to Denmark to ask the second son of the Danish king to come north and rule a newly independent land. Now you may need a wiring diagram to follow this. The Danish Prince Karl apparently enthralled the Norwegians. He was married to Princess Maud, the daughter of King Edward VII of England and Alexandra of Denmark. The Norwegians hoped the princess's connections would give them a leg up with the British. Prince Karl became King Hakon VII, named in remembrance of those Norwegian kings a half millennium before. He and Maud renamed their son Prince Olaf. Before Olaf became king in 1957, he turned more than a couple of heads in 1929 as he married his cousin, Princess Martha of Sweden his dad's sister's daughter. Their son is now king. Our heads spun as the tour guide tried to explain this tangled family tree as we walked through the palace that Swedish King Carl Johan started building in 1824 when they still ruled Norway. His successor, 
was the first to use it 25 years later. Our guide showed us a model of the much larger palace the Swedes wanted to build, but there was not enough money in the budget to build it. So they chopped off the wings of the building plans and built what little they could. Later, around 1903, they began wiring the building for electricity. Needing money, they sold the chandeliers to finance the operation. When they struck oil in the 1970s, the country had the money to buy back some of the artifacts, but our guide said only a few could be found. Oslo is a bustling city, with Oslo's Opera House located on the banks of the harbor. The angled white exterior is highlighted by near 50-foot tall windows to showcase the waterfront. Across town, the Viking Ship Museum contains some of the world's best preserved Viking relics, including three large Viking ships, sleds, trunks, skeletons, and clothing dating back more than a thousand years. The impressive display of these antiquities is brought to life with a panoramic movie cast on the walls above the exhibitions. Parks.Oslo While we were there, the locals, like the rest of Europe, were consumed with the 2018 World Cup competition. They were setting up huge TV screens in some parks for watch parties where hundreds would gather. During the day, the wanderers, like us, enjoyed the sunshine in the grassy areas in the middle of the busy metropolis. We next docked in Kristiansand on the southern tip of Norway. This small city is a Norwegian tourism mecca. We saw at least three cruise ships, including ours in port. One was using lifeboats to ferry passengers ashore from the middle of the harbor. Being a tourist magnet perhaps helped create the large immigrant populations within the city. The largest minority is Polish, followed by people from Vietnam, Iraq, Chile, and Kosovo, to name the top five. Downtown Kristiansand has a large shopping area with streets allowing only pedestrian traffic. The towering cathedral was built after several fires ravaged the city in the 1800s. The interior is covered with ornate wooden carvings. The only thing surviving the city's 1892 fire is the old town community of Posvin. Here the streets are lined with small wooden houses. Guides stated that back in the day, the houses painted white indicated wealth because white paint was so hard to obtain. The Christianholm Fortress dates back to the late 1600s and was considered the main defense of the city when it was built. The only time it was ever used in battle was in 1807 against the British fleet. One of the more popular spots in town is the Christiansand Fish Market not far from our dock. They not only sold fresh fish, but served fresh marine dishes as well. It was crowded every time we passed it. The route from town to the North Sea is dotted with rock formations, making the trip into and out of port fascinating. By morning, we were about 125 nautical miles to the north, in one of Norway's oldest cities, Stavanger, the nation's third largest city and a busy seaport. Stavanger was considered a church city in the Middle Ages and Reformation. The Stavanger Cathedral dates back to the 1100s, the St. Petri Church, is much younger, built in the mid-1800s. Today, Stavanger is the hub of the Norwegian oil industry and remains a center for fish canning. It is also one of the fastest growing ports of call in northern Europe for cruise ships. At least 187 ships are expected there this year, almost doubling the number of a decade ago. Next year, they expect that number to grow by another 25%. Just above the docks, on a hill, stands a watchtower. Back in the day, this was where the watchmen scanned the city for fires when they weren't patrolling the streets, keeping the peace and arresting hooligans. Today, as you wander the streets, there is constant evidence of the vast economy that continues to grow and the wealth it produces.
We left Stavanger to make our trip northward about 120 miles along the Norwegian west coast to one of the longest fjords in the world, Sonjafjorden. At its deepest point, this winding waterway is almost 4,300 feet deep. But at the mouth of the fjord, which we entered in darkness, the bottom suddenly rises to a shallow 330 feet deep. From there, it was 100 plus miles to our next stop through what many consider some of the most picturesque landscape on the planet. Cliffs and mountains towered over us about three quarters of a mile high. Sleeping villages and hamlets were nestled along the banks. The moon set in the west about 3.30 off the fantail of the ship as the sun rose in the east between the valleys carved by glaciers thousands of years ago. Breathtaking seems an inadequate word to describe the natural beauty of this hidden wonder. Our huge ship, almost 1,000 feet long, was dwarfed in this massive water-filled valley. Vineyards popped into view as the sun rose. We traveled about 100 miles through the fjord, made a right turn into another and arrived at our destination, the tiny town of Flom. The name Flom means little place with steep mountains and is absolutely appropriate. It was early in the morning and the sky was crystalline blue and the view was magnificent. Less than 400 people live here. However, Flom is considered Norway's fourth largest cruise port with about 175 cruise ships squeezing through the narrow fjord to this village every year. The annual tourist numbers exceed more than a half million. The hillsides around Flom, like the rest of the fjord, are still being carved by numerous waterfalls feeding the fjord we just traveled. Most of the land in Flom is occupied by roads, gift shops, and the Flomsbana Railroad Station, considered one of the world's most scenic rail lines. It's Norway's third most popular tourist attraction. We did hear a few cows occasionally bellowing in the distance, likely grazing in an adjacent valley. The train connects Flom with Myrdal, about 12 miles away. From Flom, the train climbs through 20 tunnels along one of the world's steepest non-geared railway lines. It took 16 years to construct the winding tracks that twist and rise more than 2,800 feet through the peaceful mountains. Roaring waterfalls break the solitude, like the Kiosfosen waterfall with its 738-foot drop. During the summer months, when the rain stops, an actress from the Norwegian Ballet School emerges on the hillside next to the waterfall. She's dressed as a legendary seductive Scandinavian forest creature called a huldra, dancing and singing as the trains enter the station. We hopped off the train at the mountain resort of Vantnashalsen. The isolated ski resort is a state-run facility not far from a large clear blue lake that feeds a Kiosfosen waterfall. There are some who complain the influx of people, ships, and trains arriving in Flom is too much for the tiny community and the surrounding environment. It's unlikely those critics will slow the growing number of tourists. Anyone who ever wanted to grasp an appreciation for the power and beauty of nature need only venture down this stunning valley carved for thousands of years by massive sheets of ice and water. We only had a few days to explore the exquisite beauty of Norway, but such an experience will not be soon forgotten. The Nordic vistas, once explored and ruled by the hardy Vikings, leave an impression as deep as a fjord and as long as a Norwegian summer day.